Good evening and welcome to a conversation called Andy Warhol, Fairness and Faith. Um, I'm Stephen Riley, director of the Speed Museum. When since we reopened safely to the public in early July, we've been delighted to be sharing an exhibit, a large scale exhibit called Andy Warhol Revelation, one that shares masterpieces from throughout this incredible artist's career, but in a story told through the lens of his own lifelong Catholic faith. Tonight, and in this conversation, we're joined by people who are gonna to talk to us about the way Andy Warhol may have combined his own homosexuality with his Catholicism, the way issues around Catholicism and homosexuality have been um, discussed and advocated and protested in Kentucky, and then enlarge that to a national conversation about the Catholic Church and the way it's addressed LGBTQ plus issues throughout history. And in the moment, it's changing even as we speak. So I'm really delighted. We have a great panel of people to join us in that conversation. I'm gonna first ask the, each of them to introduce themselves and I'm gonna call on Jim Wayne first. Jim, welcome. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be with everyone this evening. Uh, I'm Jim Wayne and I was a state representative in Kentucky's House of Representatives for 28 years until 2018. And uh, among the issues that uh, we promoted were the statewide fairness bill uh, to make sure there's non-discrimination against people based on sexual differences, and also the ban on conversion therapy legislation. Uh, also, have, we've worked with Catholics for Fairness group here in Louisville uh, to promote the endorsement of our statewide legislation by the officials in the Catholic Church. Thanks, Jim. It's a great legacy as a public service and mental health professional to, the, to our community and state. Chris Hartman. Thanks so much, Stephen. It's great to be with you in the Speed Art Museum. I'm Chris Hartman. I use he, him, gender pronouns. I'm executive director of the Fairness Campaign, where I've been uh, for about 11 and a half years and have been honored to work with former Representative Wayne on the Catholics for Fairness movement. And I'm excited to chat with everyone tonight. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. And thanks for all your amazing work spreading goodness and fairness across Kentucky. Um, and finally, we're joined by um, from snowy Chicago, um, by Micah Lachlan, I'm a journalist and published author. Thanks for joining us. Mike, tell us a little bit about yourself and your work. Yeah, thanks, Stephen, for having me. Uh, so I cover the Catholic Church in the United States for a Jesuit magazine called America. Uh, and I'm also the host of a podcast called Plague, Untold Stories of AIDS in the Catholic Church. And as a gay Catholic myself, I've been writing about LGBT issues in the Catholic Church for about a decade now. Uh, it's been fascinating to watch uh, how much has changed in a relatively short amount of time. Well, thank you. We're so glad, grateful to have you with us um, for this conversation. So let me start just about, we'll have some talk about art, then we'll get more into politics and faith and public policy issues. Andy Warhol Revelation, um, it's been so interesting to watch people walk through this exhibit. I should say it's open um, till the um, Sunday after Thanksgiving. Um, November 29th at the Speed Museum, open these days, Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays, you can get your ticket online. It represents an important partnership between us and the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh. This exhibit was curated by Jose Diaz, the senior curator of the museum there, who um, picked up a thread um, from actually a, a eulogy given at Andy Warhol's memorial service in a Catholic church in 1987 in Manhattan, when the art historian John Richardson said one of the untold secret important stories about Andy Warhol was his lifelong Catholicism. And what this exhibit shows is how Catholic imagery, a young boy who grew up um, worshiping in front of a iconostasis, a selection of images, important icons of the Catholic faith, ended up recreating those, but also just using that Catholic imagery throughout his life. It also addresses, and we have to guess, Andy Warhol didn't say much about his inner life. He was not very publicly introspective about his sexuality, his beliefs, his faith. Um, but this imagery tells a story of imagery he certainly took very seriously. Um, it's gotten attention. Um, the US Catholic Magazine just published an article about the exhibit, interestingly in which it said that while as a gay man, Warhol could never be completely at home in his faith, but he could never be at home without it either. So let me just turn to you all and say, what does Warhol's art tell you all about the path of an of a incredibly talented gay artist um, who also never left his Catholicism behind. 
Well, I'm for one, I'm excited to to talk about the tensions that sort of exist uh, within Catholicism and Catholic laity uh, and Catholic, you know, hierarchy throughout time. I, I mean, I think that Andy's struggle is one that many Catholics, I'm a lifelong recovering Catholic, uh, and it's one that many of us faced where the, the teachings and the tenets of the faith are so important and integral to our character. And yet there are these, these giant gaps, um, illogical really about caring for folks. And that's, I'm excited to talk to Mike a little later to hear about sort of that tension as it existed in the face of the HIV and AIDS crisis. And um, you know, I think this is a very powerful exhibit and draws attention to that, that tension that many of us face. Exactly. Jim, what about you when you walked through the exhibit? What kind of thoughts came to your mind from all that art? Well, first of all, the, the thought was how uh, amazingly gifted this man was as an artist and uh, how he used his imagination and uh, the impressions that he had from his childhood. Um, living in Pittsburgh and worshiping in the uh, Catholic church where he worshiped, how those images stuck with him and then were shared with the larger world through his art. It, it's quite an impressive exhibit. Um, Mike, thoughts from your part from, from not, not in Louisville, I know you haven't seen the exhibit firsthand, but about Warhol's art and, and how it reflects on the kind of stories you've done such a great job telling. Yeah, Stephen, I really didn't know much about Andy Warhol's uh, history of Catholicism before uh, you guys graciously invited me to this exhibit. So as, as I've been reading up on it. I was really impressed to see uh, sort of this outward expression of faith. You mentioned that he didn't uh, talk much about his inner life. Uh, but I love that quote you found because uh, through my own work, I've interviewed a number of either Catholic or ex-Catholic, depending on how they describe themselves, uh, LGBT people who say that while they never made it really work in terms of staying in the church and living um, a life with integrity and when it comes to their sexuality, uh, some of them said that they were shaped by the church and that they couldn't separate sort of their social justice uh, uh, careers or passions from what they learned as a child in the church about caring for the least of uh, the least of these. So it is interesting to see how the faith uh, really can shape people, especially LGBT people, even if it's a lifelong struggle uh, to kind of reconcile those two parts of an identity. So I was uh, intrigued to learn more about uh, Andy Warhol's uh, kind of history with this. Yeah, and, and towards the end of the exhibit, there's some very specific kind of in-your-face stuff addressing both the um, kind of um, very deep focus on the body in, the Christ in Christianity, especially in the Catholic focus, where he combines a image from a bodybuilding magazine, which was kind of the soft porn of his era, um, with the body of Christ and sort of the body, um, be somebody with a body. And it's interesting how he, not a lot, but he put those two together. I, before we turn to, I just want to say one of the great images in the, that the Warhol Museum has shared with us is a 25 foot long double last supper. And I've spent a lot of time looking at it. And I think to your point, the way that the imagery, you know, Jim and, and Michael Will are saying the way the imagery never leaves you. Also, you know, one of the things about that painting, it was done in 1986 um, at the height of the AIDS crisis when Warhol would have had friends dropping right and left. He was didn't know he was going to die just months later um, in the operating room for gallbladder surgery. Um, and I just having spent a lot of time with this painting, I know the one thing I cannot think that it, there's nothing ironic, he's not making fun of it. The imagery is very serious. Um, some say the pink, hot pink color may be a reference to the demarcation of, of gay people in Nazi Germany. You know, there's so much to wonder about, but I love the way he just puts it out there and lets us kind of walk on that journey. Because you walk a 25 foot painting, you don't just look at it all at once. Um, so thank you all. I mean, I think it's really important that we ground this in what we imagine Warhol's own life may have been like. Um, but Jim, I want to turn some of the questioning now to you. And let's talk a little bit, you and Chris, about what you all have done in Kentucky, um, which have been really important work in helping the, make the Catholic Church confront some of these issues. Well, one of the things we did um, over 10 years ago was to meet with Archbishop Kurtz, our local uh, prelate, and ask him if he would endorse the statewide fairness bill, which would uh, uh, prohibit uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation. And uh, he pledged, he and his chancellor, uh, a pledge to review the legislation and get back with us uh, with an answer. 
Uh, now, understand historically, his predecessor, Archbishop Thomas Kelly, endorsed the citywide uh, fairness ordinance that passed um, in the late 80s, I think, early 90s. And uh, also Monsignor Alfred Horgan, who was the founder of Bellarmine University, endorsed that city ordinance. So the hope was that Archbishop Kurtz would do the same, and that would put some wind in our sail uh, in Frankfurt uh, to get the legislation passed when you get the statewide head of the Catholic Church endorsing it. Uh, we are still waiting for Archbishop Kurtz's response uh, to what he said he would do. Uh, so at this time, we have not received an endorsement, which is to our great disappointment, but we persist. So what we've done is uh, annually to march to the cathedral once, once uh, a year uh, and stand in front of the cathedral uh, prior to a Sunday liturgy and um, ask the archbishop to please endorse this legislation. We are still waiting. Um, and Chris, do you want to add to any of that? Well, it, it's, it's frustrating because, again, it's, it speaks to this tension, really, that I've always felt between the Catholic laity and Catholic leadership, where we have a, a massive uh, group of supporters who have been working for LGBTQ inclusion in the Catholic Church. And locally, many of the people that Jim and I have worked with in the Catholics for Fairness movement were the ones who were on the front lines as Catholic laity, um, serving those who were suffering from HIV and AIDS in the 80s, the first, many of the first folks who really were the first responders to the long-term care um, within the Catholic Church were folks who truly believe in those tenets of the Catholic faith, the inclusion. And yet we don't see that being signaled by so much of Catholic leadership. Now that's changing uh, quite a bit with Pope Francis, which I'm sure we'll, we'll chat about. But Archbishop Kurtz has made many overtures uh, locally that he's outwardly resistant to LGBTQ rights. The reason we started protesting was because he had given of his own funds and diocesan funds to the anti-marriage movement in Maine. In 2009, it was a ballot initiative. Uh, and then, of course, he stood by the Catholic Church's uh, stance to not allow openly LGBTQ Boy Scout leaders uh, and kicked uh, Greg Burke, uh, sort of a prominent local LGBTQ leader, out. Uh, and so repeatedly, uh, the archbishop ha has been resistant. Uh, and it it's so frustrating because so much of the church and again the tenets of the faith are about embracing those among us and that's what i feel former uh, archbishop thomas kelly's statements uh, were about uh, you know pointing to um, that no one should should be demeaned that all should be supported that we should lift up everyone well, we um we can be proud of your work and jim's and i think glad you mentioned um greg and um we can also be proud of Kentucky and Louisville being the home of Greg Bork and Michael De Burke and Michael DeLeon, who were named plaintiffs in the Supreme Court case, devout Catholics and wonderful citizens and advocates who um, proudly represent Louisville as gay married Catholics. Um, and I know I'm very grateful for the role they play in our community too. Um, well, Jim, why don't we, um, I just realized, Chris, because I didn't know your religious background. I'm the only non-Catholic here. Are you? <laughs> Well, I should also just mention very quickly, Greg and Michael have fought on so many fronts. They fought just to have uh, their wedding bands in, on their gravestone, uh, and the Archdiocese has, has fought that. I mean, repeatedly, repeatedly. And it, it's so very frustrating because, you know, I, I would love to practice my Catholic faith uh, more in a formal way, but again, leadership really prevents it. Yeah. Well, let's take what a great way of springboard. I'm going to let Jim kind of take over questioning with Mike about the national and really international context of that conversation. Um, how yeah, um, Mike, I think you wanted to inquire a little bit about the current state of Catholic teaching on on uh, homosexuality. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that can be answered pretty briefly because the current state of Catholic teaching on homosexuality is that it's prohibited, right? Uh, I apologize. I think there's a siren in the background here. Uh, but yeah, I mean, the, look, the church uh, still teaches that uh, marriage is an uh, institution reserved for one man and one woman, uh, that sex outside of marriage is uh, considered a sin. So that means obviously sex between two men who are not married would be considered a sin. So on this issue, it's really kind of unchanged for a really long time. Uh, what, what I think is interesting is how we're seeing church leaders today 
uh, some really pushing the envelope about how to change the tone in the church. Uh, so as we're recording this, uh, the, the most recent news is that Pope Francis uh, said on video for the first time that he supports civil unions for same-sex couples. Uh, it was a rather limited endorsement. He was talking about how marriage is separate. The church thinks, you know, like I said, marriage is a union between one man and one woman, but he doesn't want uh, gay people to be kicked out of families. He thinks they deserve certain legal rights, including protections that would uh, protect things like healthcare, uh, you know, inheritance, making sure that they're taken care of. So it was a big deal. Uh, and it kind of sets the tone as saying, you know, if the Pope is open to this kind of thing, ordinary Catholics maybe will follow suit. So even though church teaching is fixed on the one hand, um, we haven't seen any changes to it and there's no indication that Pope Francis uh, plans to change anything. There is this shift that maybe we can be more welcoming to LGBT Catholics that there's a way to include them in the life of the church that doesn't change church teaching. So uh, there are some signs out there, I think that there's kind of a thaw maybe in the relationship between the LGBT community and church leaders. Uh, and I think that this civil unions um, talk is just the latest sign of that. Yeah. And, and I think if you go back and look historically at how the teachings of the church evolved, these teachings are rooted in uh, Greek philosophy. Uh, St. Augustine in the 400s took the uh, Greek philosopher Plato and his understanding of natural law and what human nature is, and he adapted those philosophies to the teachings of Christianity. And then uh, in the 1300s, Thomas Aquinas, the Dominican theologian, did the same thing and built on, on, um, on Augustine uh, using the Aristotelian philosophy. So these philosophies have uh, traditionally meant that sex was used primarily for procreation. Thomas Aquinas expanded that a bit and said, well, you can also have sex for pleasure. So there were two purposes. But when you think about uh, those philosophies today and what's happened in, in theological circles, there is now what's called a narrative theology that is not rooted in those Greek philosophies uh, and those uh, traditional Catholic theologians of Augustine Aquinas. Um, and narrative theology is basically what Francis is moving toward. So he's listening to the stories of the people that he is pastoring. And he is listening to those stories with a sense of mercy and understanding and inclusiveness. So it's a major shift that's going on that is not articulated very well by our United States Catholic hierarchy who are rooted in the traditional ph philosophies and theologies. But over time, this evolution is what happens in Catholic teaching. And uh, Cardinal Newman who lived in the 19th century was a pioneer in exploring how um, theology and the moral teachings of the church evolve over time. And that's certainly what we're seeing today. Um, Michael, you want, you want to maybe um, give us a little bit idea of your exploration of Catholicism and the church's response to, uh, I know something that you have studied in depth, and that is the AIDS crisis from the uh, 80s and 90s um, and on. Could you want to maybe go into that a little bit for us? Because I think that helps us understand more of the pastoral perspective of the church with regard to inclusiveness. Sure, yeah. Uh, so uh, beginning a few years ago, I started looking more closely at how the Catholic Church as an institution responded uh, during the height of the HIV and AIDS crisis in the uh, 80s and early 90s. And the reason was, uh, was because I was reporting a lot on uh, the Catholic Church and mostly same-sex marriage, because this is when uh, the Supreme Court had just uh, legalized it. The church was uh, kind of fighting against that provision for a while. And I, it just all felt really new to me. Uh, and as someone who's gay and Catholic, I thought, you know, there surely must be other people out there who have navigated this kind of tricky relationship between reconciling those two things before me, but I just didn't know the history. Uh, and I realized pretty quickly, a lot of that was, uh, my own fault because I didn't seek out answers from people who were a bit older than me and lived through this time. Uh, and some of it was because I wasn't taught this in schools or in churches or by my family. It just, it's not a topic that I think naturally lends itself to passing on to another generation. So what I started doing was reaching out to people who uh, lived through the eighties and nineties who were involved in HIV and AIDS work. Uh, especially LGBT Catholics who kind of stayed in the church during what I learned was a very difficult time with 
the Vatican really cracking down on a gay rights movement that was percolating up inside the church, and then also using its power in the public square to fight uh, gay civil rights laws. Uh, and we're talking about in big cities, Boston, New York, San Francisco, Chicago. Uh, and I, what I learned was that there was this strong perseverance among the, the gay community, the, among the LGBT community in the Catholic Church that said, you know, yes, there is this uh, sort of cracking down from church leaders, but there's also this vibrant uh, lay-led uh, response to HIV and AIDS. And that's some of what I profile in the Plague podcast. Uh, I was just talking to someone the other day who, uh, a lay Catholic who's a gay man, he was uh, friends with Dorothy Day, Dan Berrigan. So he's like very connected to that Catholic peace movement. Uh, he founded a Catholic worker house for people with HIV and AIDS uh, that he ran for a decade out in Oakland, California. And I was just curious, I asked him, you know, how did you focus on all that really heroic work while you were getting this uh, very uh, kind of hurtful message from church leaders. And he looked at me like I was nuts and said, what are you talking about? I just ignored it. I did the work I had to do and ignored the rest of it. So it is interesting to see that like this work has always been going on. It's just the messages we choose to hear. Uh, and, you know, as I said, like there is a change in tone happening in some quarters of the church. So I can only imagine the effect that hearing the Pope saying he supports civil unions or hearing uh, words from the new newly named Cardinal of Washington, D.C., Wilton Gregory, who supports LGBT Catholics. Like hearing those words must have such a powerful impact on uh, Catholics like you guys doing great work uh, on the ground to try to make the church a more welcoming place. Yeah, and I think the point you're making, too, is that uh, the hierarchy um, in this country, at least, is primarily not a prophetic hierarchy. It's a prophetic, it's a hierarchy that is uh, put into place by traditionalists uh, to maintain the church. And periodically you'll see what some of these members of the uh, uh, Episcopal class uh, step out and be prophetic. And you do see that with Cardinal, the new, new Cardinal Wilton Gregory in Washington, DC, the first African-American um, Cardinal uh, in the history of the Catholic church, but he has a long history of being prophetic. Uh, and he's the one that stood up and led the um, what they call the Dallas Charter in 2002, that basically put the limitations in place and accountability in place on the sex abuse issue. And like Mike said, he also has, has been very prophetic on the uh, LGBTQ um, community uh, for them. So, uh, and he also is the one who stood up to uh, President Trump when he uh, put the Bible in his hand and, and uh, broke through the protesters to have a photo op and he condemned that as an abuse of religion. Um, and then as a reward, so to speak, Pope Francis makes him a cardinal. So uh, I think there, what Mike is saying is there is a movement uh, in the right direction for openness and inclusiveness. And as Pope Francis would say, mercy. The other thing that ha happens within the Catholicism, and I think Andy Warhol may be an example of this, is uh, these issues are oftentimes led by the people in the pews. It's not the hierarchy who is leading the hierarchy ends up following the people in the pews. And so when we're out protesting in front of the cathedral for our archbishop to actually stand up for uh, the disenfranchised in our state, the um, LBGTQ uh, community, uh, we are actually leading the archbishop. And uh, oftentimes I think that's our role as, as uh, members of the body of Christ as, as the Catholic church. Um, Mike, could you tell us a little bit about some of the leading voices now um, on um, uh, that are that are moving in the Catholic Church in the United States on this issue, besides Wilton Gregory? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, over the past few years, my colleague at America Magazine, Father James Martin, has been uh, doing heroic work in trying to. Uh, both educate Catholics about the need to be more welcoming to LGBT people and also uh, sort of talking with church leaders to bring some of the stories that he hears from ordinary Catholics to bishops uh, to kind of explain, you know, what, what are people looking for? Maybe they're not, um, maybe things as drastic as a change in church teaching isn't necessary. Maybe it's a tone, making people feel welcome, uh, using uh, their power uh, to sort of influence legislators to pass uh civil rights laws that protect people. Sort of different ways that the church can go about contributing to this area without um, you know, doing something like changing church teaching. Uh, Father Jim Martin has been great on that. There's also um, an interesting, um, you know, a new documentary came out about the Pope where he makes these civil unions remarks. And as part of the section on LGBT people from the church, 
Uh, there's a man named Juan Carlos Cruz, who is a gay Catholic man. Uh, he's a survivor of clergy sexual abuse. Um, when he was a young boy in Chile, he was abused. And later on as an adult, he went public with this story. And he explained that the church uh, authorities in Chile actually tried to use his sexuality against him, claiming that because he was gay, he must have uh, kind of welcomed the abuse. It was really egregious stuff. Uh, and he sort of got in a public battle with the Pope because the Pope uh, sort of said, uh, I don't know if this, I believe the victims here and Juan Carlos Cruz fought back. And they've actually, as a result of that, Pope Francis said he was wrong. Um, he took action uh, and accepted the resignations of several bishops in Chile. And Juan Carlos Cruz and Pope Francis has formed a kind of unlikely friendship. Uh, they're in regular communication. Uh, when Juan Carlos Cruz uh, explained that story about uh, his sexuality being used as a weapon, the Pope told him that God made him gay and God loves him the way he is. And it was this really beautiful moment of reconciliation between a, a victim of abuse who had been ignored by the church and then the most powerful person in the church. So there's both uh, clergy voices like my uh, friend, Father Jim Martin, but then also lay Catholics who are kind of just insisting that uh, their points of view be taken seriously, like Juan Carlos Cruz. So I think there is sort of this growing movement among both LGBT Catholics and their families and allies who want to see the church be a more welcoming place. Yeah, and I think uh, locally we have Bishop John Stowe in Lexington, who has also been a prophetic voice on this issue and many other issues, uh, including the, uh, uh, the incarceration of children, separation of children from their families at the border. Uh, he's been a very, very uh, vocal supporter of, uh, of the uh, LGBTQ community and has taken action and uh, given uh, presentations on this issue. So but we do have some prophetic leaders uh, in the uh, Episcopal community. So. Like Jim Wayne, too. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, um, that's such a great story, Mike. I didn't know that about the Chilean and the, and the Pope. Um, you know, there's some pictures in the exhibit, Andy Warhol Revelation of Warhol meeting Pope John Paul II in St. Peter's Square. And the story goes that he thought he had tickets for a private audience and he ended up getting, he was in the throngs in St. Peter's Square. But, you know, it just makes me think, what if the power of that statement, what if the Pope had been able to tell him, you know, you're the way God made you and I love you. And um, so I'm, I'm kind of given some signs of hope here. Chris, how are you feeling? We're, People may watch this in the future, but we, we are eight days from election day in 2020. We're hearing some words about mercy and prophecy and narrative skills and social change. Are we, um, and I, it wasn't that long ago that the first US state uh, um, provided for civil unions. So, we, you, right. I look at the map from when I started at the Fairness Campaign and I look at the four states maybe at the time that had marriage. And now I look at all 50 of them. You know, and yet, you know, discrimination against LGBTQ people in many ways is still legal in most of the United States and in most of Kentucky, which is why it's necessary to get leadership to speak up. But I am heartened um, by uh, the overtures that this pope has made. Thank goodness uh, Pope Benedict didn't wait till the end of his life to uh, to turn over leadership to someone who has a more prophetic vision. It's not perfect, but this is the type of movement that ultimately is going to help pave the way to move a legislative body like the Kentucky General Assembly uh, to finally embrace a statewide fairness law and LGBTQ civil rights protections. We're moving in the right direction. Well, thank you for helping push us that way. Um, and thank all of you, such a, such a great conversation. Um, I'd love that we can ground almost anything in art and Andy Warhol can be a, a doorway to all kinds of conversations. I, I wish he were here. He wouldn't actually be that old. He died, I remember, before he was even 60. He lost a lot of people he knew. And it's, at the end of the exhibit, I always think about, just imagine what he might have done if he had 30 more years, as many of his peers did. Um, but um, Mike, thank you for joining us from Chicago. Jim, thank you for your service to Kentucky and to us tonight, Chris, for your work. Um, Please come join us to come see Andy Warhol Revelation at the Speed Museum until November 29th and find your own way, your own insights and doorways into thinking about how extraordinary artistic talent, a sensitive heart and Catholic faith all come together in art and um, one very important artist's life. Thank you all very much. Thank Welcome. you, Stephen. Good to be with you.